you're passionate about transforming retail operations and improving performance, plus you're accountable for key change projects and programs in your company, then you're in the right place. Welcome to the Retail Transformation Show with me, Oliver Banks. Welcome to the Retail Transformation Show. I'm Oliver Banks and I'm delighted that you could tune in today for episode 41. Now, we're talking a lot in retail about the death of the department store. You've probably seen a news article or a blog post or whatever with that very title, I guess, the death of the department store. A number of high profile businesses around the world are in challenging times and the media are quick to jump on this. It's a great story. However, I would argue that we're more in love with department stores than we've ever been before. Amazon are a department store, and they're one of the most exciting companies in retail right now. So we're all writing off department stores as a model, but what we forget is that Amazon is a department store. Now, we all know Amazon. We all know the impact that they have. They start selling in a new category, they add that level of disruption. They obliterate the market for the, the traditional players. First it was books, then electronics, and then everything, basically. <laughs> yes, that's right. Amazon have been responsible for so much transformation in the retail marketplace, either as a direct result of the R&D they do with things like Amazon Go, or as a result of companies innovating to to stay ahead to add to a competitive advantage against Amazon, the so-called Amazon effect. So in today's episode, I'm taking a slightly different look at this. I'm not looking at how Amazon are transforming retail. I'm going to look at how are Amazon going to transform themselves. They're continually evolving, continually changing the norm. And I think we'll continue to see that. So I'm coming up with a few different theories today, and it would certainly be great to hear your thoughts on this. So uh, dive into a conversation on LinkedIn or you can drop me an email, oliver.banks at obandco.uk. And I'll point out just now, show notes from today are available over at obandco.uk slash 41. So I suppose it would be worth dividing this episode up into a few different sections. I think it's really important to look at where are Amazon now? How are they doing? because some of the numbers I've got to share with you, frankly, are just phenomenal. But also, at the same stage, we're going to look at where they're struggling. They're not perfect, Amazon. They're very good, but they're not perfect. So we will take a little look at that. And then let's look at how I think they will change and evolve based on, based on some of those strengths and weaknesses from today. And finally, what is it that you need to do to remain competitive in this Amazon world that we live in today. So that's how we're going to divide this up. But right now, let's just jump straight on in. So I don't need to introduce Amazon to you, right? You know all about them. I'm sure you've seen those revenue charts of Amazon where they're just exponentially growing right up to the sky. You know, share price charts follow a similar similar route. But there are some interesting snippets that I wanted to dive into today, looking at some of the different elements of that whole Amazon ecosystem. And first, I thought it would be good to start with Black Friday and Prime Day, two big high trade periods for Amazon, of course. Now, there is a big focus by the company to refine and perfect these two periods of time. Prime Day this year in 2019 was reported to be bigger even for Amazon than Black Friday last year. So I think that's showing how Amazon are evolving and continuing to deliver consistency. They're continuing to deliver in periods of high trade volume. Now that's normally something that retailers struggle with. I'm not sure if you recognize that, both operationally, but also from a website uptime perspective as well. There are always reports of these high trade periods where a big high profile retail website has fallen over through excessive traffic, essentially. But not only is it showing how Amazon are consistently delivering through those periods, but it's also showing, I think, 
that loyalty factor from their paying Prime members. The whole concept of the Prime membership, of course, is unlimited fast deliveries, which in turn should make a customer more loyal and give you a greater share of the wallet. So I think what we're seeing here is that share of the wallet, that loyalty factor really being driven home by the Prime members. Now, there's a big shift in growing Prime memberships. In 2019, it's predicted that 51.3% of US households will be Amazon Prime members. That's according to eMarketer's latest forecast. And I'm going to put that link to that data in the show notes. And that's going to continue to grow. It's about 5.2 million more households than last year. And it's going to continue to grow, like I say, similar rates over the next few years. And whilst there are a lot of reports of people looking to cancel their Prime memberships, get out of that Amazon ecosystem, the growth rate is far, far bigger than those wanting to leave. There is a big drive by Amazon to get their own brand devices out into the market. Their range of Echo Smart Speakers continually feature prominently on the homepage, as well as big feature deals on things like Black Friday, on things like Prime Day, as well as their Fire tablets, you know, the various TV sticks and so on. But it's not just those electronic devices either. The Amazon Basics range continues to grow and they're great products. I've certainly got a few different things that are Amazon Basics and I don't think they're basic. I think they're well made. I think they do the job well. They're well priced. From a consumer perspective, they're great, but they are expanding that range. It's difficult to get an exact number of different SKUs, but it's certainly around the 2,000, 2,500 number based on Amazon.co.uk. I mentioned the smart speakers just a minute ago, and of course there is a huge push to get Alexa into seemingly every single house, every single room in the world. Alexa, of course, is Amazon's own digital assistant that sits within the smart speakers and enables your smart home. CIRP, that's the Consumer Intelligence Research Partners, showed that Amazon own about 70% of the smart speaker market. And that's a rapidly growing market, as I'm sure you can imagine. In fact, it's forecast to grow at about 40% annually for the next five years. So it's going to continue to grow. Now, whether that number is 70%, there are some reports that forecast that's a bit lower. Either way, Amazon are highly dominant in this market. But there's a whole lot more as well. Generally, these aren't quite as widely reported. You have to go a little deeper. Advertising revenue is increasing phenomenally. In 2018, Amazon adverts generated $10.1 billion US dollars in ad revenue. 10.1 billion US dollars. That's up 117% year on year from the previous year, 2017, where it was 4.7 billion dollars. Those numbers are not too shabby, I'm sure you'll agree. And I personally can see those numbers continuing to grow. So we'll come back to that in a little minute. Amazon are well known for their innovation. Patents play a big part in driving that innovation forward. And in particular, There is a big drive for Internet of Things, IoT patents, right at the moment, more so than any other retailer. CoreSight Research have recently published some data that they collected and analysed that shows that Amazon are way ahead of any other retailer when it comes to IoT patents. Almost 14 times ahead of the next retail-related company, that's Apple, And I'm going to put that chart in the show notes over at obandco.uk slash 41 so you can check it out. But it's phenomenal, almost 14 times the next biggest retailer. Now, what that chart does not include are the big tech companies, your IBMs, your Googles, etc. And I think what that does demonstrate is that Amazon aren't your normal retailer. They are more tech company, which is in line with the whole rhetoric that Natalie Berg and Maya Knight's continue in their book Amazon and we'll come back to that a bit later on. Amazon of course invests huge amounts of revenue back into R&D so we should continue to see that innovative streak continue. AWS Amazon Web Services is of course doing very well but it is potentially slowing down. Microsoft Azure are stepping up the 
competition in that area, that whole cloud computing area. And actually, Steve Dennis has just written a great article on Forbes, which I'm going to reference in the show notes that goes into that in a bit more depth. We're seeing more third-party sellers on Amazon than ever before as well. Around 50% of all sales on Amazon come from the marketplace sellers, the third-party sellers. There are over 5 million sellers now on Amazon, and it's growing at a rate of about a million sellers a year, so pretty punchy. And Amazon Logistics is an interesting piece of the puzzle as well, and I'm certainly going to dive back into this a bit later on. But they've recently started up a a franchise model, essentially. You can become an Amazon delivery service partner with a relatively low buy-in cost and Amazon branding, you know, uniforms, etc. It's going to be a big piece of their future, certainly. Now, I'm not talking about the, the sort of the gig economy type drivers that have parcels loaded to the gunnels in their own personal cars. This is much more premium. And of course, they're investing a lot more into their air freight capability as well. The Amazon Air aeroplanes for freight transportation are growing quite rapidly. They're looking to have 70 planes in the air by 2021. And of course, their whole drone R&D, which comes back to the R&D piece, it's all tying in together, of course. Their drone R&D is well publicised and feels like it's only a matter of time until we regularly start seeing those drones flying across the sky with our parcels. So there are lots of great things about Amazon. I I think they're a, a brilliant company and they're doing very well, obviously. But they do struggle in some areas as well. And that's the opportunity for other retailers. That's the opportunity for you doing what Amazon can't do. And that's a brilliant mentality which Natalie Berg and Maya Knight share in their book entitled Amazon. And it dives into the whole Amazon phenomenon, where they've come from, where they're going. And I would highly recommend, if you are enjoying this episode, I'd highly recommend you go and check out their book and add it to basket, right? And also, I would encourage you to check out episode 16 and 17 of this podcast, where we were lucky enough to be joined by both Natalie and Maya who dropped just a whole load of golden nuggets when it comes to Amazon and the whole mentality around what Amazon can't do. Now, one of the key points from that conversation back in episode 16 and 17, and you can get those either, of course, in your normal podcast app, by the way, or go to obandco.uk slash 16 or 17. So one of the key points in that conversation was about Amazon being very functional, but not very fun. They haven't cracked the whole relationship side of business yet. They haven't cracked the whole experience side yet. And whilst we collectively shop for everything in numbers on Amazon.com or .co.uk or whatever domain it is, the loyalty there could be quite low. So if a company, let's say Alibaba, were to come out with a similar competitive proposition, I think we could see a number of different customers being easily coaxed out of the Amazon ecosystem and into this competitive ecosystem as well. Equally, the whole marketing and personalization element is just not as strong as it needs to be in the whole Amazon ecosystem. Emails are very product-based, you know, very much a, dear customer, we sell this, want to buy it? You know, it's not, it's not very good retail, frankly. And, you know, if, if that's your email marketing, then do look to shift it up add more value, have more personality. The recommendations are also off quite a lot at times. I think there's a huge amount of opportunity for Amazon to further optimise the frequently bought together buttons. And of course, there is that classic example, which certainly brought a smile to my face. You know, if you were to buy a, a toilet seat, let's say, you're going to see toilet seats recommended to you for the next couple of weeks and only toilet seats. It's like, I've already got one though. So the whole marketing and personalization element is a big opportunity that Amazon are not doing very well. They do struggle with. The range on Amazon is deep. I think you could, you could, you could confidently say deep, right? <laughs> and it's expanding exponentially. You know, the whole marketplace piece where they're growing a, a number of different sellers now is only adding more fuel to that fire. I personally think it's now got to a highly confusing stage. There's just so much. To illustrate the point, 
here's a little case study, okay? So I've done a search for electric toothbrushes. I looked on Debenhams. I got 20 results to choose from. I looked on John Lewis. I got 22 results to choose from. I looked on Argos. 39 to choose from. I checked out Boots. 60 to choose from. I also did a bit of searching across the pond. Target had 104 different results to choose from. Walmart had considerably more. 796. So electric toothbrush had 796 results. And that's of course a mix of both the heads and of course the units. So Walmart had 796. Far surpassing all of those other companies that we've just spoken about. So Amazon, how many do you think they had? Well, Amazon came back with over 20,000 results and it maxed out their search results counter. So it was 20,000 plus. So goodness knows, frankly, how many electric toothbrushes I would have to choose from. But where on earth do you begin with that? So I think that whole USP piece is also one of their biggest weaknesses. There is no curation. There is no recommendation. Not like, you know, your Debenhams, your John Lewis, your Argos, your Boots, where actually, you know, there has been a curation, a selection of that range to make sure it's a good range of products, but not confusing. Amazon, 20,000 plus. Yeesh. <laughs> and finally, one of the other areas where they're really challenged right now are the whole reviews piece. Or well, not so much reviews, but review integrity, review authenticity, review trust. It's a real challenge. The whole paid for reviews piece to try and skew those star ratings, that is going to be a big thorn in Amazon's side, which they do need to tackle. So Amazon clearly doing very well. They have a lot of strengths, but they also have their weaknesses, their areas of challenge as well. Which brings us round to how do I see Amazon evolving and changing? And I think there are going to be some areas where they'll continue to do well. Amazon Web Services is a great example. They'll continue to drive that. And it's arguably going to become less dominant with the whole advent of Microsoft Azure cloud services, etc. as well. But I think there are going to be six big changes that we will see in the near future. The next probably about five years or so. So number one. In a few years, I predict Amazon will be a marketplace only and not a retailer. So I don't think they're going to be selling other people's products at all. I think that's all going to be done through third party sellers. I'll come back to the logistics piece at the moment, but it may still be fulfilled by Amazon, but you won't have sold by Amazon up there. And as such, I think we'll continue to adopt Amazon as a verb. You know, I'll Amazon it. Just like we say, I'll Google it. And that will mean shopping online, but it won't mean buying from Amazon, just through Amazon. So Amazon will become a channel, a marketplace, rather than a retailer. Secondly, as such, I think analytics as a service, which doesn't have a very nice acronym, I'm sure you'll agree, will be a rich revenue stream as they start to offer more access to these third party sellers on a pay-as-you-use basis or a subscription basis, to offer access to all of that rich data that they are capturing, whether it's on-page analytics, more than just views, how are people scrolling down the page, where are they clicking on, where do they want to know more information, or is it what's coming through the search bar? I think we'll see more analytics as a service being opened up to retail businesses, opened up to manufacturers, producers of products. The third item is around advertising. Now, we've seen that phenomenal growth already, but I think we're going to just see that explode. Amazon ads are going to be the next big thing. We all talk about personalized Facebook ads, but when it comes to retail and it comes to selling stuff, Amazon ads are going to be where it's at. You're going to be able to target deep down in using Amazon's rich data sources, using purchase history, using sort of that personalization aspect. I think we'll be able to see Amazon ads go crazy. So start looking into Amazon ads right now if you're a retailer and start to understand how to get the most out of them would be my prediction there. We touched on Amazon Basics as a brand of products and I think we'll continue to see that being forged. I think 
Amazon Basics is going to be how Amazon tackle the curation problem. So they'll create their own branded product, which they will sell. That will be the only thing that they will sell. Everything else will be through a marketplace, as I say. And they'll, of course, have all of that data source to, to make sure that they're optimizing the, their range in the best possible and most profitable way. The fifth way that I think they'll, they'll transform themselves is around the whole logistics piece. I think they'll massively disrupt the whole logistics business, the whole last mile delivery. Amazon Logistics is its own separate entity, and it's going to be a big beast. I feel it coming. It's going to start offering its service to other businesses. And frankly, that whole last mile delivery piece, it, it's ripe for disruption right now. The whole bit about, you know, you have a street and you've got all these different branded delivery trucks or vans driving up and down, delivering to maybe even the same houses. It just feels wrong from a productivity perspective, from a cost perspective, from an ease perspective, from an environmental perspective. It just feels wrong. And it feels like Amazon Logistics are going to be what shakes it up. And that franchise model that we spoke about earlier is what's going to give them the vans on the road that enables that to take place. It's not just going to be shipping their own products through their own logistics routes. It's also going to be the last mile solution in a premium way, similar to a, a, a DPD or a UPS, but at cost as well, right? Doing the classic Amazon driving down the cost and really opening up the competition in that market. So if you are in that logistics market space, looking at last mile delivery, I'd be quite worried about the whole Amazon logistics piece. And finally, the IoT piece, the whole smart home is going to explode. We've seen the number of patents that they're applying for has massive potential for lots of different innovations. So I think we're going to see Alexa not just being at home, but actually through everything. So those are the six ways that I think we'll see Amazon continuing to transform, continuing to evolve. They were, number one, becoming a marketplace, not a retailer, becoming a channel, not a retailer. Number two, offering analytics as a service, and that being massive. Number three, advertising going crazy, and Amazon ads being the next big thing, massively wiping out Facebook ads. Number four, own brand Amazon Basics will be their solution to excessive range and real challenge about product discovery. Number five, Amazon Logistics will massively disrupt the last mile delivery marketplace as we know it today. And number six, expect the whole Internet of Things piece to explode much more than we think we've got today. Alexa will be everywhere and we'll have AI integrated into our modern day world in a ways that we just can't even imagine right now. And it's all hidden in the, that massive patent pile that has already grown and continuing to grow. So the final part of this episode was briefly looking at what should you do as a result of all of this? What should you do to evolve as Amazon evolves? And that's assuming that you're not working for Amazon, right? If you are working for Amazon, let me know. What do you think? Am I on point? Am I missing the ball? Is there something else? You probably can't tell me that. But if you're not Amazon, then what should you do? Well, first and foremost, and you'll probably, you'll probably think I'm a bit crazy for saying this, right? First and foremost, do not think of Amazon as a competitor to your retail business. Think of them as a channel. You know, there is so much opportunity to get in on that whole marketplace piece. If you're not selling on there, you definitely should be. And if you are selling on there, are you selling quite as well as you could do? The brilliant Viv Krask is a fantastic contact for setting up your Amazon store in the best way possible. I'm going to put the link to his bio on the show notes page over at obandco.uk slash 41. And what he's done, he's got some amazing content, particularly on LinkedIn, that he produced during Prime Day, looking at how to optimize and accelerate Amazon as a channel. So don't think of Amazon as a competitor. Think of Amazon as a channel. The second piece of advice is focus on your niche and your USP. Identify your ideal customer and really optimize your business for them. Optimize 
your offering, optimize your proposition, optimize your whole operation for that ideal customer in that niche focused on your USP. And you have to challenge yourself as well. Will that USP be big enough to carry your company? You know, if you're an electric toothbrush producer or retailer, what is it you're going to do to be able to stand out from that that massive crowd that are all on the Amazon platform or in the digital world? And my final bit of advice is actually some further reading or further listening. I mentioned the the episodes number 16 and 17 of this very podcast of the Retail Transformation Show with Natalie Berg and Maya Knight. So definitely go and listen to them and definitely go and buy their book, Amazon. In particular, get into the whole concept of what Amazon can't do and start to focus on this and what it could look like for your business. So those are my three bits of advice, what you should do. And I'd love to hear from you. How do you think Amazon will transform and evolve over time? Have you got some different perspectives? Do you think things are going to go in a different route? Have we reached peak Amazon? Are they going to explode or implode maybe? Drop me an email, oliver.banks at obandco.uk. And I'm also going to be hosting some interesting discussions and conversations on LinkedIn. So look out for one of those. And if you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, then do make sure you reach out and connect. Remember to personalize your invite so I know you're listening. It would be great to hear from you and get your thoughts as well. Show notes once again over at obandco.uk slash 41. And whilst you're there, if you've not signed up for my free weekly retail transformation briefings, then make sure you do that. It's a way of getting some curated intel and insight, inspiration and ideas to help you with your retail transformation journey. So you can sign up there on the show notes page obandco.uk slash 41 for those weekly retail transformation briefings. So let's wrap up our conversation right here. I'm going to look forward to joining you once again on another episode of the Retail Transformation Show very soon. Hit subscribe if you've not already done so and have a brilliant week. Catch up soon. Mm-hmm.